Good morning. Good morning. My name is Steve Carlson, and uh, I'm retired almost three years come October. I was pastor of Bethel Lutheran Church in Fresno for 36 years. Longtime friend of uh, Pastor Brian Mallison, and Glenn reminded me that about 30 years ago, we were attending a evangelism conference down to Crystal Cathedral, and one night I needed to go to a drugstore to pick up some medication. So Brian and everybody in the van drove me to the drugstore where there was a strike going on. And there's a picket line in front of this drugstore. So what does Brian do? He rushes up to the picket line, stops the van, pushes me out, says, good luck. <laughs> musicals, but dramatic music written for the films. I have over 500 recordings of film music. Wow. My wife thinks I should join a 12-step program. <laughs> and I know all the composers, and, and uh, usually if I hear, see a movie for the first time, and I hear the music again, I can pretty much guess who wrote the music. Um, I am kind of a nerd. <laughs> But when I was 15, there was one film recording that I very much wanted and did not have. It was Dmitry Tionkin's beautiful score to The Old Man in the Sea, starring Spencer Tracy. Beautiful score. It was long out of print. But I diligently searched all the record stores in Los Angeles trying to find this one recording. I spent endless hours searching through stacks of old LPs trying to find this one record. And I said to myself what we often say to ourselves, if I can just find this one thing, I'll never ask for anything else. <laughs> Life will be good. Did I mention I'm kind of a nerd? <laughs> then one day, in a record shop in Culver City, I found it. It was on the wall rack. It was just sitting there. Nobody was paying any attention to it. For good reason. High price on this record. And I debated with myself whether or not I should buy this record. I had saved money from my lawn cutting business, so I had the money. But should I spend that much money on this one record? But I knew. I knew if I'd left, only to return and find that it was gone. I would never forgive myself. So I bought the record. Bought it home, put it on the record player, and I was deeply disappointed. Because besides being very old, it was also very dusty, it was full of nicks, it was menorah, not stereo, and the orchestra sounded like a bunch of chipmunks playing the music. <laughs> it was not good. And then to add insult to injury, a month later, Columbia Records reissued the record. <laughs> Brand new, mint recording, beautiful stereo sound, you know, everything I wanted. Did I mention I'm kind of a sucker? <laughs> treasure hunts. We all go on treasure hunts, seeking that one thing that's going to make us happy. Our lives are a constant search for that one missing ingredient, that one possession or quality that will make our lives complete, that will give our existence meaning, fulfillment, a sense of purpose and wholeness. And very often, too often, we are disappointed. The treasure turns out to be fool's gold. Yeah. Not what we thought it would be. It never it's never as good as it looks. And once we have it, once we have it, it no longer seems seem so vital and important. So think about it. What uh, fool's gold have you gone after in your life? What have you gone chasing after that you thought was going to make everything right, only to find out it didn't do that at all? Treasure hunts. We all go on treasure hunts. Jesus talks about our treasure hunts in our gospel today, but there's a twist. For the treasure hunts he speaks of are successful. There's the man who discovers a treasure hidden in the field, 
And quickly, without telling anyone, he goes and gets all his money, he buys the field, and he has the treasure, and he's very happy. Now understand, Jesus is not commending the sneaky way this guy got the field. See, the point of the parable is not in its details, it's in the punchline. And the punchline is simply this, that the treasure he gets is worth all the money he spends on it. And then in the second parable, we have a merchant who finds a pearl of great price, goes and sells all, all that he has to buy this one pearl. And it's worth all the sacrifices he makes to get it. And the common denominator for both people is that the joy they have in securing this treasure and this pearl. This, Jesus says, is what the kingdom of God is like. Now, Jesus is not saying that we have to sell all that we have to buy the kingdom. We cannot buy the kingdom. The kingdom is not for sale. Is that something we have to dig up or go searching for? The kingdom is given to us through Jesus Christ. By his living among us as one of us. By his death on the cross. By his resurrection. By his call to discipleship. In all these ways, Christ gives us the kingdom. And yes, in this discipleship, there are some challenges, there are some difficulties, maybe even moments of suffering. But there is also great joy. There is joy in knowing the love God has for us. There is joy in hearing that call and answering that call to share this love and show this love to other people. That's the treasure. That's the treasure. It's what we're seeking. Nothing else in all the world, with all its fool's gold, with all its glitter, nothing else is greater than this treasure. Nothing in the world with all its false promises can surpass this valuable pearl. The question is, the question is, will we recognize the true value of this kingdom? Every day we are seeking this treasure. Every day it is given to us. And this treasure, this kingdom, invites us to commitment. We used to have a black Labrador dog named Cassie. I really loved that dog. And an outdoor cat named Abby, who I didn't like very much at all. And most of the time, they got along with each other. But every once in a while, Cassie would decide to do what dogs like to do, and that is chase a cat. <laughs> so every once in a while, we would hear all of a sudden a uh, scuffle of paws, and we'd see the cat, Abby, making a beeline for the fence, and in hot pursuit would be Cassie right after her. But every once in a while, Abby the cat had had enough. And so suddenly she would stop dead in her tracks, turn around with the hair bristling, the claws out, and hiss at Cassie. Cassie would hit the brakes, turn around, and run away. <laughs> you see, uh, Cassie liked the chase. She didn't like to catch. We are seekers, seeking the truth about our lives. But we don't always like to find. Because finding calls for commitment. It's like those dinner buffets we go to. You know, there's the food all spread out, the vegetables, the potatoes, the rice and everything, and you have the entrees, the desserts. We only got one plate. And you gotta pick what you're gonna put on that plate. So we walk around sniffing everything and maybe even sneaking a taste of something. I never do that. <laughs> and then we have to make those choices. We have to make the commitment and put the food on the plate, right? There are many religions and philosophies in this world. So many lifestyles to choose from and goals galore to commit to. And some of them are nothing more than window dressing while others have 
adequate insights and gifts to offer. What Jesus is telling us this morning is that while some of them are good and important, they are not the treasure. They are not the pearl. They are not the kingdom that he wants to give us. Because committing to the kingdom means this is it. This is what I'm going to center my life on. This is what's going to shape who I am. This is what's going to guide my words and my actions. This is committing our life to what is true. Now understand, devoting our lives to Christ doesn't mean we give up or ignore what is important in the world. On the contrary, what it means is that following Christ, all the segments of our life assume their proper priority. We can have money and possessions without them possessing us. We can love and care for our families without becoming controlling or manipulative. We can have careers and work without becoming workaholic. We can find joy and beauty in the wonder and complexity of this world without exploiting it and without worshiping it instead of the Creator. Because when we follow Christ, everything in our lives assumes its proper place. Our lives are good and balanced because we are following His priorities. So what was Christ devoted to? As we read the Gospels, we can easily see that He was devoted to us. He was devoted to giving us God's grace and forgiveness. He was devoted to restoring our human dignity. He was devoted to feeding the hungry and helping the poor. He was devoted to the healing of mind, body, and soul. Now that's devotion. Is the kingdom of heaven, is Christ's purpose for us, a priority for us? Is it that treasure, that pearl, that will do everything to possess? And have some homework in your bulletin. Paul Fonkin told me what color this paper is, and I forgot already. Anyway, it's this color paper. <laughs> and your homework is simply this. List the five priorities you have in life. What are your five top priorities in life? And then for this coming week, record how much time and effort you put into these priorities. Are we devoting time and talent to what we say is important in our lives? And even more important, is our list, the list that Christ wants us to have? After much prayer, he decided to change careers and go back to school. To do, it, to do this, he had applied for all sorts of loans and scholarships, and one loan in particular would pay for everything. It would pay for his school, he wouldn't have to work and go full time and get it done all that much quicker. Just one problem. He would have to doctor his financial statement in order to be approved. Friends urged him to do so. His own counselor at school said, everybody does it, don't worry about it, go ahead and do it. He thought about it. He prayed about it. He decided that yes, Jesus did want him to change careers. Yes, Jesus did want him to go back to school. But he also decided that Jesus wanted him to be honest. He did not doctor his loan application. His loan was denied. 
He did, however, go back to school. Part time. It took longer. It was harder. But he did it the way he knew Jesus would want him to do it. That's the treasure worth having. That's the pearl worth finding. That's the kingdom at work in our lives. That is following Christ. And there is joy in following our Savior. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share the peace with each other.